further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike McFadden from the class of 1968. Dr. McFadden is a member of the team that won the 2007 Nobel Prize with um, Al Gore for his uh, research on uh, climate change. He is a NOAA scientist uh, and is currently still doing research and is going to talk with us today about his research into El Nino and its impact on climate change. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Mike McFadden. Thank you, Jay, for uh, the introduction and, uh, and thanks for the invitation to speak at this alumni event today. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you who've joined me from wherever you may be, I don't know, spread around the country or Western New York. Um, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity today. Uh, first, I wanna give a, uh, a shout out to Canisius High School on its 150th anniversary. Uh, I really value the Jesuit education that I received at Canisius. Uh, it stood me in good stead uh, throughout my personal and professional life. And, uh, and I believe uh, firmly that it was uh, foundational in any success that I may have achieved over time. Um, so without further ado then, I want, to, I want to show some slides. Let's see, we can do this. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen with you and hope this works. Ah, okay. Uh, can you all see that? Jay, can you see that? Uh, I can see your screen, yeah. Yeah, can you can see that title slide? I cannot see the slide right now. Oh, okay. So what there you go. I can see it now. Yep. You did see it. We, we just had it. Okay, now? Okay. Coming back? Not quite. I can see your screen. I can't see the slide. Okay, so what are we there, doing, Robert? Now, 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 now you're on, Mike. Got it. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good now. Oh, we just lost it again. Okay. All right. I think there's a lag. When you say I yeah. you can't see That's it, I go back I to do something. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so we'll wait. Lag. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me when you can see it. No go. Not quite yet. There it is. Okay, good now? Yep, good. Okay, good now. okay, great. All right, so I'm going to talk about El Nino and a changing climate. Uh, you probably, most of you, if not all of you, have heard about El Nino in some form or another. Uh, El Nino is the name that uh, Peruvian fishermen in the late 19th century gave to a warm current that occurred off their coast every year around Christmas time. Uh, and so it's a, in specific reference to the Christ child. Uh, in some years, this current was unusually warm. And during the, these times, uh, it uh, reduced the abundance of fish that they were able to catch. Uh, and it's these unusual warmings every few years that we now refer to as El Nino. Uh, we had a big El Nino in 2015 and 16. Can you see this next slide just to make sure it's sequencing properly? Yep. We can yeah. Okay, great, great. Okay, um, this turned out to be one of the strongest El Ninos on record. Uh, you know, it's, the, the press made hay with the, the term Godzilla El Nino, but it was in some ways apt, you know, this larger than life, uh, intimidating, uh, potentially highly destructive beast. Um, and, um, you know, scientists have been, have been fascinated by this phenomenon for more than 50 years. You know, what causes it? Uh, why are some larger than others? Uh, how do we predict it? And these are important questions because of the, um, the global reach that El Nino has. Uh, in 2015-16, for example, uh, you know, there were extreme weather events all over the world that we could relate back to the tropical Pacific. And uh, you know, what El Nino does is it shifts the probability for a certain kind of weather pattern to prevail in various parts of the world uh, towards drought or uh, severe flooding, 
uh, heat waves, extreme events like uh, uh, frequent hurricanes or typhoons. And these weather hazards have real impacts on people's lives and property. Uh, they affect agricultural production, uh, they affect freshwater resources, transportation, public health, and so on. So they're very, very consequential. The, uh, and these are a few examples. You know, if I put up a picture like this not too many years ago and said, what do all these, what do all these weather disasters have in common? You know, people would scratch their heads and you know, not know. But now today, we can point to a common cause in many cases back to the tropical Pacific. I also want to say that um, El Nino tends to peak at the end of the calendar year. That's why we often refer to them in uh, uh, two years, 2015-16 in this case. They generally reach their maximum development in November, December, and January. Uh, now, El Nino is really a, a part of a complex that we refer to as El Nino in the Southern Oscillation. And this is a year-to-year -year fluctuation of the climate system that has been occurring naturally for millions of years. Uh, between warm phases we call El Nino and cold phases La Nina. Uh, the southern oscillation is kind of the atmospheric counterpart to the oceanic warming and cooling that is part of this cycle and that hence we refer to it as El Nino southern oscillation or ENSO. Uh, it is the, the strongest year-to-year -year fluctuation on the planet and it's uh, as I mentioned, its reach is global, and the way it affects the rest of the globe is through the shifting patterns of uh, what we call deep convection or these massive uh, thunderstorms indicated by the little cloud symbols. And those thunderstorms tend to follow uh, the warmest water, and it's the movements of these massive thunderstorms that release tremendous amounts of heat into the atmosphere, and the atmosphere responds all over the globe by changing uh, the patterns of air currents. So that's how, that's how uh, what happens in the tropical Pacific does not stay in the tropical Pacific, but uh, its reach is felt uh, globally. Now, it turns out that when I was in high school, uh, this is my high school class picture from 1968, uh, this was the beginnings of the modern era of ENSO research, although I did not know it at the time, that would come later. And it's thanks to this gentleman, Jacob Bjorknes, who was a uh, Norwegian meteorologist who emigrated to the United States uh, at the beginning of World War II. He'd already established a reputation for his work on uh, weather systems and mid-latitudes, and he became fascinated with this curious current that the uh, Peruvian fishermen had been talking about. And he made uh, several fundamental discoveries from his work 50 years ago in two landmark publications. And the first one was that this was not something confined just to the coast of South America, but in fact, it extended all the way across the tropical Pacific basin. And the second uh, thing was that uh, to understand El Nino, you had to understand that it was an interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean. Both were required for an El Nino to, to happen. And it was a chain reaction, basically when the trade winds would weaken, the surface waters would warm, that would cause the trade winds to weaken further and cause uh, further warming. And so you had this kind of runaway uh, positive feedback that would amplify any small perturbation in the tropical basin. And the, the third important insight he had was that uh, what happened in the tropical Pacific could affect weather at higher latitudes through atmospheric teleconnections. And in fact, this publication this is the front page of his uh, 1969 publication, Atmospheric Teleconnections from the Equatorial Pacific. And then the final in insight they had was that this, this phenomenon might actually be predictable. And the reason was because in the ocean, the variations in the ocean take a very long time to uh, develop it. And if you could track what was happening in the ocean, you might be able to predict what was happening in the atmosphere some seasons in advance. So, oops, uh, fast forward to 1977. Uh, the winter of 1976-77 was extremely cold in the eastern half of the United States, so much so that it made uh, for a story in National Geographic. And uh, on the left side here, you see Furman Boulevard in Buffalo, these are two guys digging their car out from mountains of lake effect snow. 
And um, you know, Birtney's ideas were beginning to catch on and they were listed as among the possible causes for this severe winter. In fact, it turns out that 1976-77 was an El Nino year. And, uh, and it was this event that caught my attention and got me thinking about uh, El Nino as a subject of study. Uh, at the time, I was a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego. This is my office from uh, that time. Uh, I want you to notice the different uh, kinds of weather here, uh, cold and snowy Buffalo and uh, warm, balmy Southern California. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great place to do graduate uh, studies in San Diego. So, but th this is what got me interested in El Nino, and I decided this was going to be uh, uh, what I was going to focus on for my research. Um, so, okay, so let me, let me show you an index that we use to characterize uh, the ENSO cycle of El Nino and La Nina events. It's a bit of a jargony name, the Nino 3.4 index. The main thing to realize about this, though, is it's a large aerial average of deviations from normal sea surface temperatures in the central Pacific, where the overlying atmosphere is particularly sensitive to what is happening at the ocean surface. And the red peaks in this uh, diagram, these are the El Nino events of the last 40 years. This goes from 1980 to uh, almost the present. And the blue troughs are the La Ninas. And so you see three big events in this El, El Nino events. One is 2015-16. That's the one here right at the end of the record. I've already mentioned that one. It was another big one in 1970, uh, 1997-78, right in the middle of this uh, plot. And then there was a big El Nino in 1982-83. So I want to talk about this 82-83 El Nino a little bit. And um, so I got my PhD in 1980, and uh, you know, I was well on the way to doing my research on equatorial ocean dynamics and its role in climate. Uh, here I am as a young PhD attending a meeting in Liège, Belgium, uh, called the Hydrodynamics of the Equatorial Ocean. This is the meeting proceedings, and uh, the title of my talk is up there at the top. I don't know if you can read it, Equatorial Sea Surface Temperature Variations on Seasonal Time Scales. Uh, so there are about 100 and 150 people at this conference, not a big conference, but uh, the fact that there were so many gathered was uh, telling uh, on how, uh, uh, how much interest there was in learning more about this El Nino phenomenon. What we didn't know at this meeting, in fact, nobody knew at this meeting, is that the strongest El Nino of the 20th century was underway. And the remarkable thing about this, this El Nino also made it to National Geographic in 1984. Uh, the remarkable thing about this El Nino was that it was not predicted. I mean, that's not so remarkable because we hadn't yet developed forecast models. But it was not even detected until nearly at its peak. And there were two reasons for this. The first was that uh, NOAA had recently launched some uh, Earth observing satellites that could measure uh, the temperature of the sea surface from space. Uh, what they hadn't figured out, though, is how to deal with uh, atmospheric aerosols or, or tiny dust particles and how that might contaminate the record. Uh, it turns out that the Mexican volcano El Chichon erupted in March and April of 1982, and it threw this massive cloud of, sul of sulfuric dust into the stratosphere that affected, effectively blinded these satellites. And if it weren't bad enough, we had no data coming back from the ocean in real time. By real time, I mean like right now, uh, you know, within hours of the time it's been collected so that we could see what was happening in the ocean itself. But we didn't have that kind of data back then. And this was a real shock to the, the scientific community. We didn't know that the biggest El Nino on record was underway until almost October of 1982, almost at its peak. And, um, the remarkable thing about this is the international community was planning a 10-year program to study El Nino. So how can you study something you can't even observe? And so that 10-year program that we developed was eventually named TOGA, the Tropical Ocean Global Atmosphere Program. 
And one of the defining challenges of this program then was to design an observing system that could be used to monitor the evolution of conditions in the tropical atmosphere ocean system in the Pacific in particular, and to feed data into forecast models that could use, be used to predict. So uh, it took the 10, 10 years of this TOGA program, 1984, 1985 to 1994, to build this observing system. Uh, it's basically a network of deep ocean moored buoys. The schematic of the buoy is shown on the left. It's a uh, toroidal tape shaped float, a donut shaped float with an instrumented tower for meteorological measurements, uh, three to four miles of nylon and steel cable below with uh, oceanographic instruments. Uh, we anchored to, to the ocean floor with old railroad car wheels and we powered these uh, buoys with flashlight batteries. We had to make them cheap because we needed to put them out in large numbers. And so uh, the other important feature of these moorings is that all the data were uh, transmitted to shore in real time uh, so they could be used to monitor the evolution of the evolving conditions in the Pacific and feed into forecast models. Uh, so like I say, it took, it took the full 10 years of TOGA to build this, but when it was done, it was a tremendous success. And uh, we were ready for the next big El Nino that came in 1997-98. And I'll just show you some of the data from the, uh, the mooring array. For two Decembers, these are uh, December 1996, which was a normal year, and uh, December 1997, which the, is the El Nino year on the right. And what's shown is the ocean temperature and dynamic height. Dynamic height is basically sea level. And uh, so the contour that kind of that surface uh, is uh, a measure of sea level. Uh, warm water is less dense than cold water, so it takes up more volume for the same mass. And so where the water is unusually warm, sea level will be higher than where it is cold. And uh, in the case of uh, 1997, uh, now that perspective you're looking at here, consider your, your you know, in the Andes, you're looking down at the Pacific Ocean. And the, in the foreground is the Eastern Pacific, and in the background in the distance is the Western Pacific. And North is to the right and South is to the left. So um, for 1996, you see the water at the surface is rather cold. Uh, it's being drawn up from, uh, cold water is being drawn up from below the surface through a process we call equatorial upwelling. Uh, that upwelled water cools the eastern Pacific and then it's transported westward by the trade wind driven south equatorial current. And on its westward uh, uh, pathway, it's being heated by the sun and so it's being piled up as a warm pool in the western Pacific. Uh, during uh, Mike, I think we're having some technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Jay, can you hear us? I can. Mike, can you okay. hear us? Hey, Jay, I had this happen when I was running a meeting about a week ago, and if he uh, tries to do a restart, he'll be able to rejoin if we just stay here. Um, I ended up having to do a restart on the whole computer because I couldn't get the connection again, but we'll see if he comes back. All right, we'll give him a minute here. Hey, Jay, do you have his uh, cell phone that you could call him? I do. I'm going to give him a shout here real quick.
All right, hang tight, everybody. All right, it looks like we got Mike back. Let's give him a second here and we'll get back on. So, uh, uh, how long was I out? I got a message that flashed up, dropped, drop call or something like that. <laughs>
just a couple of uh, just a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, so we're back. We're back. We're back. Okay. All right. Well, we'll try to pick this up again. All right. So the last screen that you were on was the um, the multicolored ocean graphs, I believe. Let's see. Okay. Uh, can you see that? Oh. Uh, can you, can you see that, Jay? I can see your screen, not the slides yet. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, did did we get to that? We did. Okay. How does it look? Looks pretty good. Feels good. Very right. good. Feels good to me. Yeah. Stop on down. All right. I appreciate your taking care okay. of it. <laughs> so did. We, so did we do this slide? Uh, we did not do that slide yet. Uh, okay. And what about this slide? Uh, we did not do that one. Okay, this is the one. Yep. Then we, oh my goodness, oh, we got cut off. A, okay, I'm sorry about that. That's all right. Yeah. 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 That's okay. right where we got cut off. Yeah, okay, okay. So this is just comparing a normal year 96, December 96. So with the, yeah. yeah, with the big El Nino of 1997. And how dramatic the differences were in terms of the temperature structure over one year uh, that we were able to detect from this this network of buoys. Um, and the other thing was that we not only could map out what was going on in the ocean, but we could feed these data into forecast models and forecast not just the temperatures in the tropical Pacific, which is shown on the lower left, and how they changed. Uh, this is a forecast made in June of 1997 for uh, the winter of 1997, and it was a remarkably good forecast. Uh, not just the temperatures in the tropical Pacific, but the rainfall pattern over the United States for the winter of 1998 was predicted uh, a season in advance as well, with some degree of accuracy. Not perfect, but, but some degree of accuracy. So, the buoy network and the forecast models that were developed during this 10 year program called TOGA were a great success. And uh, there is a, uh, there was a video made about the 97, 98 El Nino by uh, the PBS uh, public broadcasting systems, part of its NOVA series. Uh, it's on YouTube. You can, you can Google chasing El Nino, Carol Fleischer. She was the producer. Uh, and it, um, tells about the 97, 98 El Nino, about the buoy array, and uh, it takes you out on the ship that we use to service this, uh, this network. So it it's actually still reads pretty well after 20 years. I'm kind of surprised. I, I watched part of it the other day. But you might, you might find that interesting. Um, so when we were done with the Pacific, uh, you know, we thought this, this uh, worked pretty well for El Nino. We expanded the array in partnership with other institutions uh, in other countries into the uh, Atlantic Ocean to study the West African monsoon, the cycle of drought and uh, flooding in Northeast Brazil, and into the Indian Ocean to study the monsoons there, the Asian monsoon. And, um, you know, we've been doing this for about 40 years now. Uh, the statistics of, of um, some of the measures of uh, effort are down in the lower right. Uh, we've deployed about 2,500 of these moorings. They have a design lifetime of a year because the batteries run down and the uh, instruments run out of calibration. Uh, so about 2,500 moorings and over 400 cruises using 53 different ships from 16 countries uh, and over 36 years at sea. So basically, uh, this 36 years of sea during a 40 year period says that at any given time there's a ship out there servicing these moorings in one of the ocean basins. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the big question on everybody's mind now, which is uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation and a changing climate. And actually we have a book coming out on this uh, sometime later this year. Uh, and, you know, we know that the climate is changing. Uh, this is the trace of global mean surface temperatures uh, going back to 1880. Uh, temperatures today are about uh, a degree above the 20th century average. 
a degree Fahrenheit. Uh, the last five years were the warmest five years on record, and the first two decades of the 20th century were the warmest two decades in the last 2,000 years. So as the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change uh, said in their 2014 assessment, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And uh, we know the reason why is because humans are uh, burning fossil fuels and, uh, and uh, pumping greenhouse, tra heat trapping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, we're now at 400 parts per million, that's 40% above pre-industrial levels, and uh, they, the curve is ever upward. These are the highest concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the last 800,000 years, according to Greenland ice cores. And the climate will probably continue to warm. Uh, these are projections into the future using various climate change models. Uh, the red curve is what we call business as usual. If a society does nothing to limit the uh, combustion of greenhouse gases, uh, and deforestation is another big uh, source of CO2 to the atmosphere. Now we could be four degrees Celsius or eight degrees Fahrenheit higher in the atmospheric temperatures on average than we are today. Uh, the blue curve down at the bottom is if the society aggressively tries to mitigate through decarbonization uh, and, you know, it will still be higher than we are today, but not quite as much, maybe only one degree Fahrenheit or a half degree Celsius. So, you know, the, the questions that, you know, we ask ourselves is uh, when it comes to climate change and ENSO is does ENSO affect climate change? That's one. And the other is does climate change affect ENSO? Uh, so for the first question, does ENSO affect climate change? Uh, not directly, but what it does affect is our ability to detect climate change trends. And let me illustrate that. Um, that this shows over the last 40 years, the monthly average global temperature anomalies. It's the top curve, that's black. And you can see the steady, relatively steady rise in global mean temperatures, but it's not uniform, there are ups and downs. Those ups and downs are related to the ENSO cycle. And you can see there's our Nino 3.4 sea surface temperature time series on the bottom. When it's warm in the tropical Pacific, three months later, global temperatures go up. And when it's cold in the tropical Pacific, three months later, temperatures go down. Uh, and the reason is because uh, during an El Nino, the ocean is warm and it's releasing a tremendous amount of heat into the atmosphere. Atmospheric circulation spreads that heat around and after about three months you'll see a peak in global temperatures following the peak in uh, El Nino. And during El Nino, La Nina the skies are clear in the tropical Pacific, there's more sunlight being absorbed and that's drawing down atmospheric temperatures. So the warmest year on record for the globe was 19, that was 2016, that was during this big El Nino. Uh, and since then, the temperatures have come down on the global average uh, from that peak, even though carbon dioxide has gone up. And you know, climate change skeptics would look at this and say, well, climate change can't be real because the temperature, temperatures globally are cooling now from their peak in 2016. And so, you know, if you're if you're ever uh, questioned about how uh, downward trends in global temperatures can somehow uh, be consistent with global warming, uh, this is part of the answer. We know that there's a lot of natural variability in the global signal of uh, mean surface temperatures and it comes out of the tropical Pacific. Uh, uh, but the real big question is, does climate change affect ENSO? And there are two parts to this, has climate change affect affected ENSO already, and how will climate change affect ENSO in the future? And on this first question, uh, what we can say is there's no obvious changes that we can detect in the behavior of ENSO because of greenhouse gas forcing. Uh, the last 40 years have been pretty active in terms of the number of uh, strong El Ninos, uh, but there were periods in the late 19th century, early 20th century that were also very active. There's a tremendous amount of natural variability in the ENSO cycle. And so it's hard to detect uh, at the current levels of greenhouse gas forcing a significant and obvious change in ENSO behavior. Uh, but what we can say is that climate change is amplifying ENSO impacts. 
And I'll illustrate this briefly with uh, two examples from the 2015-16 El Nino. And they're almost obvious in retrospect. One is coral bleaching. Uh, corals bleach when the temperatures of the water temperatures exceed a certain threshold and they expel uh, these um, zooxanthellae, they're these um, uh, zooplankton that live in their polyps that provide both color and food. And so when the temperatures exceed a certain threshold, these zooxanthellae are expelled, the corals bleach, and if the waters remain warm enough for long enough, they die. So 2014-16, these were all warm years in the tropical Pacific. This was the longest, most widespread bleaching on record. 40% of the global reefs were affected. Great Barrier Reef was almost completely bleached and a quarter of it died. Previous global bleaching events were in 1997-98, 2009-2010. These were El Nino years. But they weren't as severe because the background temperatures from global warming hadn't risen as high as they had in, by 2014 to 16. The other big example, uh, the other uh, example rather of, of uh, the compounding impacts of uh, climate change on ENSO is the record year for tropical storms in the Pacific. Uh, this was uh, tropical storms, hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons like to grow on uh, temperatures, sea temperatures that are 26.5 degrees Celsius or above. Uh, there was plenty of that warm water around in the tropical Pacific because of the big El Nino in 2015, but it got an extra boost because of the warming trend from greenhouse gas forcing. And so uh, this was uh, a record year, both in terms of the number and the intensity of uh, tropical storms in the Pacific because of the combination of global warming and the big El Nino. And then the final um, question is, how will climate change affect uh, ENSO in the future? Uh, for this, we have to rely on the big computer uh, climate change models, um, and there's a lot of uncertainties with these, projecting not only the uh, global mean temperatures, but uh, the details of how ENSO may behave in the future. But we can find uh, from a, a body of literature uh, a couple of points that we agree on, and one is that strong El Nino events will likely become stronger, and the frequency of strong El Ninos and La Ninas will likely double by the end of the 20th century from once every 10, tw once every 20 years today to once every 10 years in the future. So these could have real significant impacts uh, when considering how uh, El Nino affects uh, weather patterns around the globe and society through uh, impacts on uh, agriculture and uh, public health and so on. So I'll just end with uh, a little bit about the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, this was awarded in 2007 to uh, Al Gore and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, Gore won it because of his movie, The An Inconvenient Truth, which actually also won two Oscars, one for the best uh, documentary. Uh, it, was, uh, it had a lot of uh, good production qualities, but it was also informative and accurate. Uh, he got it right about the mechanisms and the consequences of climate change. He did that because he relied on the information provided by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and in fact, he enlisted many of the scientists who contributed to those reports to advise him. Uh, the IPCC is a UN organization. It was created in 1988 to advise governments about the, um, uh, the causes of climate change, uh, the consequences of climate change, and what are some of the actions that nations could take uh, to mitigate some of the more severe impacts. Uh, the, uh, the IPCC has issued four, actually it's issued five assessments, the first in 1990, again in 95, 2001, and in 2007. I contributed to the 2007 assessment, uh, at the year that the uh, IPCC and Gore were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, the IPCC, it was not just for the 2007 assessment, it was for um, 
all the authors and the reviewers of documents going back to the very first report. So there were about 2,500 authors and reviewers who shared the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore. Uh, there was a fifth assessment in 2014, and the sixth assessment will come out in 2022. Now, this is the official Nobel uh, medal. Uh, there were two of these minted for the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. One went to Al Gore, and one went to the IPCC secretariat. Uh, so the rest of us 2,500, uh, we didn't get a medal, but uh, in my case, uh, my daughter made me an unofficial Nobel Prize medal. This was made out of a, a, tie, a, a, a pie pan and some tin foil spray painted gold. So uh, this is my, uh, in addition to being listed among the IPCC authors, this is, this is my token of um, the Nobel Peace Prize for 2007. And uh, with this, I will end. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Great, Mike, thank you very much. Um, we do have quite a few questions, so I'm gonna start. Uh, Give me a second here. Let's see, one from, hold on. Uh, mm -hmm. Trey McDermott asks, do El Nino and La Nina baseline temps change with climate change or are these baselines the same as when begun in the 70s? Yeah. Uh, the, the baseline has changed. The baseline is, is uh, warming because of greenhouse gas forcing. Uh, what is not clear is whether the ups and downs associated with El Nino and La Nina are changing. Uh, the evidence so far suggests that, uh, we call that the, the variability. Uh, the variability doesn't seem to be changing. The, the, the character of El Nino and La Nina ups and downs doesn't seem to be changing. Uh, it may be, but uh, there's, there's so much um, variation that it's hard to pull out a clear signal of the impact of greenhouse gas forcing on ENSO itself, but it's occurring on a warmer background state. And that's why even if El Nino and La Nina are not changing themselves, the fact that they're occurring on a warmer background state means that their impacts are being amplified. Got it. Uh, Joe Smith asks, who funded the Pacific Buoy Array? Most of the funding for that came from NOAA, but we had, uh, we had five international partners altogether, the US, Korea, uh, Japan, uh, Taiwan, and France. And during the 10-year period of this uh, international program, they all contributed uh, smaller amounts than NOAA did. Eventually, the partnership uh, revolved, it, it, the partnership devolved to just two countries, the US and Japan. So only the US and Japan are now involved in maintaining the Pacific Array, but originally it was five. Gotcha. Do you, uh, do you wanna comment on how or why that relationship devolved into just China and, or uh, Japan and, and the US? Yeah, um, the, uh, <clears throat> this program called TOGA, Tropical Ocean Global Atmosphere Program, it was a research program and uh, you know, although it was a very, you know, long duration, 10 years, a lot of the countries got involved as basically a, a one-off thing. You know, we want to we wanna be players, we want to learn something, uh, but we're not going to commit to a long-term, uh, you know, proposition of maintaining a, uh, an observing system in the Pacific Basin. So in the case of France and, and Taiwan and uh, Korea, you know, they contributed during that 10 year period, but after, after the research program was over, they said, and we're gonna do, you know, we don't have as many resources as you and Japan have, you know, so we gotta, we gotta be careful about how we, we spend our research dollars. So that left the US and Japan to say, okay, this system is working, we have to continue it. And so we're gonna fund it on a longer term basis, uh, which is more operation, a combination of operation and research. Cool. 
Uh, Mike Shergett asks, are the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans differently affected by El Nino and La Nina? Yes, I mean, the, um, uh, the ground zero for El Nino is the Pacific Ocean. In a, in a big El Nino, the west coast of South America gets hammered. Uh, now, it does affect the Atlantic Ocean, but that is farther afield. And so the effects are somewhat diluted. Uh, El Nino also affects the Indian Ocean, but again, because it's farther afield than ground zero, you know, it's not as, as a uh, strong or consistent a signal. So ground zero for El Nino is the Pacific. Gotcha. And our, our final chat question is uh, Joe Smith, again, who wants to know, how did you decide to pursue graduate school? <laughs> it was by chance. Uh, you know, I got my degree in physics from the University of Buffalo in 1973. Uh, you know, this was during the environmental, you know, kind of the uh, post, you know, the, during when Rachel Car Carson wrote Silent Spring, uh, and, you know, the environmental movement was underway. I wasn't sure that I wanted to do traditional physics. You know, I felt like I wanted to do something that was more environmentally oriented, but I wasn't sure what that was. So I was waiting on tables and I was teaching eighth grade science. Uh, and I decided to take a night school in oceanography because I liked to scuba dive. And, you know, after a quarter of, you know, night school in oceanography, the professor said, you know, if you're not doing anything with your life, you might want to think about graduate school. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. Okay, I'll try it. So I applied to a few schools and got accepted. And, you know, but it was, you know, I had no visions uh, until, you know, the year before I was applying to graduate school or months before I was applying to graduate school that this is where I was going to go. And I got lucky, I have to say, I got lucky because it's been a good fit. Cool. We have another uh, chat question from Aravind. Uh, I'm going to butcher your name. I apologize, so I'm not even going to try. Um, with the worldwide shutdown of manufacturing and other pollution-causing industries this year due to COVID, have you already seen quantitative changes, or is it too early to still tell? You can see a downturn in the uh, emissions of fossil fuels on a global basis. And you can also see a reduction in the emission of... Um, what we call anthropogenic aerosols, soot, you know, uh, from manufacturing. Uh, so those, you can, you can see a reduction in, in um, uh, aerosols from satellite and you can measure from these measuring stations like Mauna Loa, you can see the slowdown in the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's, it's a few percent, it's not, it's not an enormous amount, but you can, you can measure this now. The, Will this have an impact on the rise in global temperatures is the question, and that's, that's less clear. It'll have, you know, it, it may mean that the temperatures don't rise quite, quite as much, um, but even with the small reductions that we're seeing in carbon dioxide, they're still uh, going up overall. Along similar lines, um, what, in your opinion, to, for us to reverse this in the long term, is there, what is the single most important change that we can make that will help curb some of this climate change? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would say it's a change in attitude because when it comes to climate change it's such a complicated problem, there's no single silver bullet. Uh, you know, there is conservation, there is uh, technology development, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things that we can, we can think of uh, carbon sequestration, you know, afforestation, which is planting more trees. Uh, but what it really takes is coordinated action of individuals, corporations, and governments at all levels. For that to happen, it first has to be realized that there is a problem. And without that, uh, it's, it becomes kind of a piecemeal approach and it's, it will not be as effective, you know. So, you know, they, the message is real simple. The climate is changing. Humans are responsible. Uh, we can do something about it, but we need to act. And it's a threat. And, you know, 
if everyone was on that same, you know, mindset, if everyone was on the same track, then we could come up with sensible approaches to dealing with it that don't compromise economic development, development necessarily, but put our ingenuity to work to figure out how we can solve this existential threat, which is the defining problem, environmental problem of the 21st century. Great. Um, Jay. Yes. Oh, sorry. Do you mind if I jump in? I got a question. Not at all. So I was just going to say it's about 555. So um, if you want to ask another question, by all means, please go ahead. I'll, I'll open it up um, if we have any other questions as well. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, Maybe muted. He is. Oh, sorry. Am I off mute now? You're off. Go for it. Okay, sweet. Um, so yeah, I was just, you know, kind of dovetailing with what you were just saying um, with regards to um, the role of, of science in society. One, one kind of emergent trend that I've been interested in recently is what appears to be um, the adoption of, of anti-science movements. Um, and so I was wondering, um, you know, is there anything you're doing from a scientific communication standpoint to um, temper the, uh, I guess, like the co-opting of, of the science that you're involved in? And, um, uh, you know, moving forward, uh, is there anything, um, you know, that, that we could do to, to further promote the adoption of, of science as, as an objective um, worldview? as opposed to, you know, the, the politicization of, of some elements? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, you know, the, um, uh, you know, people have uh, belief systems and some people are not going to be swayed by the facts because they have, uh, you know, they have some, some other motivations for, you know, doing what they do and believing what they believe. Uh, from a scientific point of view, that's, that's a bias that's very difficult to fight. Uh, I think a couple of things. One is you, you try to communicate with people about values, not necessarily so much about details, about values. What do you value? You know, do you value uh, a better world for your children? Um, you know, we're, find, find where there's commonality and values and then try to have a conversation around that. Um, the, other, the other aspect I would say is that uh, when it comes to communicating broadly about things like climate change, the message have to, has to be simple, it has to be authoritative, and it has to be repeated over and over. So, you know, so depending on the audience, my line is always, you know, climate change is real, Humans are responsible. It's a threat, but we can do something. And let's figure it out what it is that we can do together uh, based on our common shared values about where we see, you know, uh, society headed in the future and, and what kind of world do we want in the future. Well, fascinating. Yeah, thank you very much for your, for your insights on that. One, one last follow-up, I guess, would be, if in hindsight was Al Gore's involvement in um, the inconvenient truths, do you think that globally like helped the advancement of, of the adoption of, of the acceptance of, of climate change as a reality, or do you think that it, it had more of a negative impact? <laughs> That's a good question. People have talked about that, you know, for those who, uh, I mean, the climate change deniers, I mean, he's demonized. There's no question about that. I mean, uh, uh, you know, but uh, he's, uh, he really got the science right. I mean, it's, you know, that inconvenient truth is, is kind of an entertaining hour and a half long PowerPoint presentation, but, uh, you know, he, he brought it home in a, uh, an easy to digest, you know, in an easily digestible way, very authoritative. Uh, he got the science right. Um, you know, you can't fault somebody for doing that, for doing the right thing. Uh, with the right information. Uh, again, this is, this is the polarization and the politicization of, of this topic where certain people are gonna believe certain things and you know, you, there's, a, there's a segment of society whose mind you will never change and there's not much you can do about that. 
what you have to work on is, you know, that group who is really uh, skeptical, but willing to listen a little bit and then try to find ways to connect with them. Thank you. That's about 5.59. Doc, are you okay if we go a couple of minutes over? Sure. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it open here if anybody else has any questions. I've got a question for you. You kind of touched on it a little bit already, but there's, um, there's obvious socioeconomic impacts of, you know, more powerful El Ninos and climate change. Can you discuss those a little bit? Well, I mean, there is a global fingerprint uh, of impacts uh, related to El Nino. And, you know, we have, when an El Nino occurs, we have a pretty good idea about what regions are going to be affected and how. Uh, if uh, the, the magnitude of El Ninos increases or their frequency increases, then these regions will be even more impacted, more severely impacted, either because the, these big events are coming more often or because the big events have just gotten bigger. So, uh, you know, so there is, I mean, there, in many ways, you know, what the concern about climate change is, is not that global average temperature is going to go up by three degrees, because people don't feel global average temperature. They feel what's going on in their area. And so it's the regional impacts of climate change that concern people and extreme events. And so, uh, you know, the hurricanes and typhoons are likely to become more extreme. El Ninos are likely to become more extreme and those all have regional impacts. Those are the things that uh, are really a concern, not, not the, you know, the average temperature of the globe, but, uh, and so, you know, we have indications that big El Ninos are going to be even bigger and they're going to come more frequently. So, you know, in places like uh, Western South America, I mean, these, 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 you know, they can suffer very severely. Indonesia is another place. It's very dry during El Nino events, out of control wildfires. You know, so all the places we see in El Nino and La Nina impacts now, we'll see them even more dramatically perhaps in the future. Anybody else have uh, any questions? All right. Well, uh, Dr. McFadden, I want to thank you so much for um, giving us your, your time today. We appreciate it. Um, thanks for everything. Congratulations on your uh, both of your Nobel Prizes. <laughs> um, so again,